Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Hello, family and friends on social media. I want to welcome you today to the ever increasing world feast. Abel Damina is my name. You need to invite a friend, a family member, a loved one. I'm telling you, you need to tag some people. Share the video on your page. Share with all the groups on your page. It's going to be an exciting adventure in the world of His grace. Always a pleasure and an honor for me to serve you the grace of God right here on this platform with the word of His grace. You know, Brother Paul said, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you your inheritance among the sanctified. That's exactly what we're about to experience today, the teaching of the grace of God. Now listen quickly, please. I want to encourage you to order for my books. The books are on the screen right now. All of them have been written doctrinally to enrich your work with Christ, to give you robust revelation that brings you to a place of accurate, precise knowledge of Jesus Christ. Our vision is to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. That's what this is all about. Building you, equipping you, so you too are able to do the work of ministry so that the body of Christ is edified. Now listen very carefully. Those of you that are following my teachings right here on social media, if you are in a place where you are not able to attend any local assembly, either because the message of Christ is not well taught or there is no church there that teaches the gospel of Christ the way we do right here in Power City. And you really want a family of believers to belong to. All you need to do today is send me a mail asking for a place to identify with believers in your community. You know, God sets the solitary in families. God wants you to be a member of his family. Two things will happen. Number one, you will bless us with the grace of God on your life. And we will in turn bless you with the grace of God on our lives. It is called mutual faith. You cannot afford not to belong to a local assembly. So that's why it's important for you today to quickly, quickly, if you don't belong to any, reach out to me, send me a mail today, and we'll be glad to respond to your mail. Let me also mention very quickly, for those of you that want to be part of my mentoring academy or our Bible school online, we have an online mentoring academy and Bible school. If you want to join today, all you need to do is send me an email. It's a one-year mentoring class where I mentor you personally. And I'm able to meet with you once every week to share with you and fellowship with you, answer your questions and effectively pastor you and watch you grow into the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm truly excited about this opportunity to make a difference in your life. But listen carefully. It's going to be exciting as we study the word of God today. You know, every day we're on social media twice a day. 12 noon, GMT plus one and 6 p.m. GMT plus one. Tell everybody about this. And I'm looking forward to a wonderful time of studying together with you even now. So fasten your seatbelts as I take you on a gospel adventure into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. We've been looking at the healing ministry of Jesus. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Wherein you stand. Or, wherein you take a stand. Wherein you take a stand. That word wherein you stand is the same word for wherein you take a stand. Taking a stand is not salvation. So taking a stand here is against false teaching or taking a stand against false doctrine. It's the same word that Brother Paul will use in the book of Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Stand fast, take a stand talking about the preaching of the law and he says uh, you've got to take a stand against the preaching of the law because it will bring you into bondage 
So you stand fast, take a stand in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? He says, you have believed the gospel. You are saved. Now that you have received salvation, take a stand. Now that you are saved, take a stand. A stand against those who have facts that seems to contradict what you believe. The word stand is a Greek word, histomai. It means to take a stand against. It's not salvation because if you have to take a stand to be saved, it means you saved yourself. All right? So it's not salvation. It's taking a stand on doctrine or to take a stand against false teaching. And then verse 2 now, we said in the course of explanation that verse 2 will have to either be, you know, on its own because he now says, by which also you are saved, full stop. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So the word you are saved there has a closure. So now if you keep in memory, it's not, it's not a condition for salvation. It's a different line of thought. If you keep in memory, because he was laying a framework for what he was going to say in verse 12, which we just read about some false teachers who brought in false teaching into the church at Corinth, that there is no more resurrection of the dead. So he now says, you take a stand on doctrine. He now says, if you keep in memory, that word, if you keep in memory, is the Greek word katacho, K-A-T-A-C-H-O. It means to hold on. You can only take a stand if you hold on to something. Not because you are saved, but because you are holding on. Don't forget, you are already saved. So, you can only take a stand if you hold on. To take a stand is to be resolute on something. To be resolute on something. To take a stand. Or to have a firm grip on it. To have a firm grip on something. That's what it means to take a stand. You must take a stand. A stand with how that, verse 3. You take a stand with how that Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures. Verse 4. And that he was buried. That's what you take a stand on. And that he rose again the third day. According to the scriptures. That's what you take a stand on. That's what you hold on to. That's what you are resolute about. That's what you have a firm grip of. That Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day. That is what you take hold on. Or that is what you are resolute about. It's not up for debate. It is the fundamental that makes Christianity what it is. You must hold on to the fact. You take a stand on it. Katecho is useful to arrest something. If you know, it's not something you want to argue with someone about. It's something you've decided. It's not up for debate. We take a stand. We hold on to the fact that Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day. According to the scriptures. The facts of the gospel are not up for arguments. Who does the taking of the stand? You. How? By holding on to. You take a stand. How do you take a stand against false doctrine? By holding on to the facts of the gospel. What are the facts of the gospel? That Christ died according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So he now goes on to verse 10 of the same First Corinthians 15. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. He now talks about his ministry. He talks about the fact that he's an apostle. He talks about, you know, he listed 
how that some of them saw him physically and how he also saw him as one that was born out of due season by revelation. All right? So he talked about the eyewitness accounts and he talks about the revelation of Jesus that was given to him from the scriptures. Don't forget, we said there are two scenes, the physical eye account and the revelation that brother Paul saw. Then he proceeded to verse 11 of the same chapter. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach. That means we have the common position. Whether it was I or they, so we preached. And so you believed. It shows the common denominator of all the apostles. Whether myself or themselves, we preach, you believe. Then he goes on to say in verse 12. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? He buttresses the fact that the moment you say there's no resurrection from the dead, then you go against the very verities and the fundamentals and the facts of the gospel. So that's why now he emphasizes in verse 14 of the same chapter. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. The moment the preaching is empty, the believing is empty. That word vain is the word kenos, K-E-N-O-E-S. It means empty or unreal. Our preaching is empty or unreal if Christ is not risen and your faith is empty or your faith is a figment of imagination, it does not exist. In other words, it means the resurrection of Jesus is the content of the gospel. The resurrection of Jesus is the content of the gospel. Because without it, Paul is saying, without the resurrection, our preaching is empty. Without the resurrection, our preaching is empty. And the believing equally is empty. So, the resurrection is the crux of Christianity. That's why there are Matthias. The Matthias who died. They died for the gospel. Because they believed that Christ rose. They believed that Christ rose. And because he rose, whatever sacrifice they were to make was worth it. It was not an issue to die. To die because of the gospel. To die because you believe that what you are dying for is a worthy cause. They saw him rise. They were eyewitnesses. He said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the parousia or the phenoresis or the apocalypsis or the revelation of the Lord Jesus. We have not followed devised, crafty, fairy tales. We have not followed a make-believe. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Glory to God. Remember in verse 58 of the same chapter. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, your faith is not in vain, our preaching is not in vain, so your labor is also not in vain because he rose from the dead. He's alive and he is alive. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. He now brings in the believer's identification by resurrection. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You are not laboring on empty facts. You are not laboring on empty facts. Look at verse 14 of the same chapter. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Then look at verse 15 of the same chapter. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. If the dead don't rise, we are false witnesses. It means we are witnessing what does not exist. He's still making a defense against our false teaching that said there is no resurrection of the dead. Now he says we become false witnesses of God. Pseudo Matthew, that's the Greek word. Pseudo Matthew means it's a lie. To say something that never happened. Pseudo Matthew. 
to say something that never happened it means what witness we are giving is a lie is unfounded that's why he said if then there is no resurrection it means we are false witness it means we are talking about what never really happened now so whatever they preached was what was real look at matthew 26 verse 59 now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus. They sought what? False witness against Jesus to put him to death. But found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. There was an open announcement anybody that can fabricate a lie that is a lie enough to kill jesus has a price people started coming and all their lie did not pass the test of lies when they brought their fabrication it was too light they couldn't come up with anything that was concrete enough until these two brothers showed up these are demonic geniuses and said this fellow said i am able to destroy the temple of god and to build it in three days they said he said but he didn't say that jesus never said what they said <laughs> jesus never said this thing they are saying it sounds like what jesus said but this is not what jesus said they said jesus said i am able to destroy the temple of god and to build it in three days that's not what jesus said jesus said you destroy the temple because jesus is not a destroyer you destroy it i am a builder you destroy i will build but they now said that jesus said i will destroy and i will build so they lied on jesus in a crafty way you need to know what jesus said very well to know what he didn't say they brought this false witness against jesus so a false witness is one who says what does not exist and there are many of them in the world of social media they will create pictures, they will create videos, they will create stories, and they will make it very real. Very real. Because you read it, it moved you, you sympathize. You help them push it. You become a proponent of a lie because it looked so real. We live in a world where anything can be made to look real. You've got to be careful. You've got to have your discernment on. And the only way you can have your discernment on is to grow up in the knowledge of the word. The word, the knowledge of the word sharpens discernment. We live in a very, you know, very, 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 very wonderful world. So a false witness is one who says what doesn't exist. So Paul says, if this resurrection never happened, we are false witnesses. We are false witnesses. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 17 now. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. He now changes the word there. He uses another term. Your faith is worthless. Worthless. Matthews. Something that has no value. Your faith is worthless. Worthless. You will see the use of that word in Acts 14.15 for further study. Acts 14.15, Titus 3.9, James 1.26, 1 Corinthians 3.20. That's the one that is more precise. It says, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. They are worthless. The thoughts of the wise are worthless. That is, the intellectual capacity of a man. To know the work of the cross is worthless because the work of the cross can only be known by faith the intellectual capacity of a man will end up being worthless because he can't make meaning he can't find reason 
on the work of the cross because the work of the cross my faith that is why the cross to them that perish is foolishness but unto us that are saved by faith it is the power of god you can't understand the work of the cross by intellectualism there is faith required to operate that way and if an intellectual tries to reason it out it will become of no value the message of the cross to a carnal man is of no value a carnal man will prefer to hear a message on how to make it how to make soup how to sew clothes how to survive recession how to be on the cutting edge in the global economy that is a pastor preaching from the pulpit how to survive the economic meltdown of the 21st century is a message from the pulpit as if it is a world economic forum he has messed up the kerugma of the gospel he has messed up the kerugma he is no more preaching the gospel because the gospel is a specific information the gospel is not a generalized message no it is a it's a common message it's a common message that's why paul said whether it were they or i we preach you believe because the message is one but to a man that perish he will rather hear how to survive the economic meltdown of the 21st century how to gain an edge on global market using technology it makes sense but to say christ died he was buried on the third day he rose makes no sense because the man is perishing but to us that are saved when we hear that we are eating fat glory to god i say glory to god i say glory to god so the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit but paul is saying that our faith is of no value if christ never rose from the dead so christ being raised from the dead is the worth and value of the gospel so his resurrection is what makes it the gospel there was not a time the death of jesus was ever referred to as eugelion eugelion is a greek word the death of jesus was never referred to as eugelion rather it was referred to as a substitution as an offering it was never referred to as an anti or a hooper for our sins but his resurrection that is the eugelion that is the self fulfilling promise that is the promise of god fulfilled the death is not a fulfilled promise the resurrection is a fulfilled promise in that he raised jesus from the dead the scriptures are being fulfilled in that he raised Jesus from the dead. Glory to God. Yeah. So that's why the good news is not that Jesus died. The good news is that Jesus rose. That's the good news. The gospel is predicated on his resurrection. That's why it's when he rose from the dead that he now told them go into all the world and preach the gospel what gospel the gospel of his resurrection he didn't tell them to go and preach the gospel of it is finished when he said it is finished on the cross he had not even died so there was no good news in it is finished to preach the good news to preach is after he rose when he rose from the dead he said now you go into all the world and tell them the good news that i have risen from the dead and by resurrection sin has been defeated and the spirit of adoption is now available i will be a father to them and they will be my sons and daughters oh glory to god oh i feel like dancing in this place i tell you that's good news somebody shout good news so that's why his resurrection is the gospel that we preach so the good news is that he rose from the dead that's what our faith is based on that's what we believe and that's what the crucial point is so now look at this let's go back to first corinthians chapter 15 verse 5 and that he was seen of kephas or cephas then of the 12. 
Next verse. After that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. They saw a man. He was seen, it's not vision. They saw a man. When he rose, they saw a man. That's important. Look at it. Let's establish it. Luke chapter 24, verse 37. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Next verse. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Next verse. Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Next verse. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have you here any meat? Next verse. And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb. Next verse. And he took it and did it before them. Spirits don't eat food. He's alive. And he's real. Glory to God. They were able to prove that this is the same Jesus that they knew before he died. They touched him. They were able to prove that the man that died is the man that has risen. It's not a different person. John 20, 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Next verse. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Next verse. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Next verse. Then said it to Thomas, reach it at thy finger, and behold my hands. Reach it at thy hand, and thrust into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord, my God, finger, my hands, my Lord, hand, my side, my God. He touched and touched, and said, yes, you are the one. It's not another person. <laughs> Glory to God. Somebody say they saw it. This is eyewitness. John 21 verse 5. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. This was after resurrection. Next verse. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Next verse. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, it is the Lord. This one is the Lord. They saw a miracle. Before he died, he did miracles. When he rose, he continued doing miracles. Why? Miracles are God's character. In God's character, he does miracles. Miracles are not our redemptive right. Because if miracles are our redemptive rights, unbelievers cannot access it. Whatever redemption brought for us is for us. But God's character is for us and them. Healing is not a redemptive right. Healing is God's character. Because if healing is a redemptive right, it means you have to be born again before you are healed. But he healed them all. Believers, non-believers. You don't have to be a believer to be healed. You don't have to be a believer to have a miracle. It's God's character. He loves man. So he does miracles for sinners and Christians. He does miracles for believers and unbelievers. He heals unbelievers and believers. He heals anybody who wants healing. Yeah, it's not a redemptive right. So that's why he won't say, because Jesus died, I am healed. No, he heals because he loves man. And that's why you can receive it anytime you want it. Did you hear what I said? You can receive healing when? Anytime you want it. Because that's God's character. Anywhere. Irrespective of who you are. If a Muslim is sick, lay hands on them. 
If an atheist is sick, lay hands on him. If a Buddhist is sick, lay hands on him. They will, they will be healed. Jesus healed them all. He demonstrated that it is in God's character to display his goodness of healing on everybody. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing some that were oppressed. Healing some that were oppressed. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God's character was in display. He healed everybody. He didn't exclude those to heal. In other words, they were able to attest to the fact that he was alive. So, if he is alive, who is he? John 14, 11. Believe me that I am in the Father. And the Father in me. Or else, believe me for the very work's sake. Why did he ask them to believe him? Because, honey, you know in chapter 14, he said to them, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place. So in their minds, he has gone. But now he's with them. So he said, look, you better believe I'm the one. Believe me. I'm in my father. My father is in me. Believe me. That's why they were to believe. The essence of believing here is to believe in his resurrection. Verse 12, he now says in verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do. Why? Because I go unto my father. Remember, the focus of the believing is to believe that he rose from the dead. So the next verse now explains what he means, verse 13. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. I am the one that will do it. That the father may be glorified in the son. I am in my father, my father is in me. The father is doing it, I am the one doing it. I am doing it, the father is doing it. That the father may be glorified in the son. What it means is, I will do it, I will do it. Meaning, he will be the one doing it in me. Because he lives in me. How do we prove that? Same John 14, 20. At that day you shall know that I am in my father and ye in me and I in you. After resurrection, I will be the one in you healing the sick. I will be the one in you exercising authority. He does the work in us. Jesus is saying what I do, what I did in the incarnation, I will do in the resurrection as proof of my resurrection. I healed in the incarnation, I healed in the resurrection. I worked miracles in the incarnation, I worked miracles in the resurrection. It is the same person. It is the same person. He has not changed. He never changes. He said that so that you will know that truly he will be raised from the dead. You will see the same works done because it's the same person. Consistency. Now, why did he say greater works than this shall you do? The greater works will be because I live in you. Him living in you is the greater works. Him living in you. He now lives in you. Somebody shout Christ in me. Now say very loud, he lives in me. What is him living in you? That's what we call the ascension. So you will see that whatever he did in the four gospels is still available today. He healed, he's still healing. He worked miracles, he's still working miracles. He raised the dead, he's still raising the dead. But however today, he's doing it through us. Hallelujah. Somebody say I'm the extension of God's hands. When I preach, people are saved. If I don't preach, I deny them salvation. When I pray for the sick, they experience God's character. If I don't pray for them, I deny them God's goodness. I am the extension of God's hands in my world. I didn't hear your amen. Yeah. Say with me very loud, I heal the sick. In the name of Jesus. I cast out demons. I raise the dead. I cleanse the lepers. I cleanse the lepers. I heal the sick. I heal the sick. Now say, because you do it, I heal the sick. Demons obey me. 
I'm in authority here. I thought I would hear powerful amen. He rose from the dead. They touched him. They saw him. Honey boy, you know, he vanished from their sight. He vanished from their sight. And after he vanished from their sight, he said to them, I am with you always. He vanished from their sight. Then he said to them, I'm with you always. You know, he is living in them. Look at it, Matthew 28 verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 20 carefully. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Was this before resurrection or after resurrection? After. And lo, I am with you sometimes. Always. Even unto the end of the world. Amen. Always. From after he rose, he never left. He's been with them. He's been with us. He is with us. Will always be with us. In other words, when he was saying, I am living, what he was saying is, I'm leaving your side to live inside you. He had already told them, in that day, I will be in you. So now, he had to go off their sight so that the reality of the indwelling will dawn on them. You know, Pastor Brett, as long as Jesus was physically there, the reality of him being inside will not be there because they will focus on the physical. So he disappeared so that the reality of this one will dawn. The same thing with vision. If you like visions too much, you will never believe the Bible. If you like visions too much, you like to see things, you will never believe the Bible because your visions will be more real than what is written, even if it contradicts what is written. And that's why many visions are always a contradiction to the Bible. So that's why you don't follow visions. Even if you see a vision, you subject it to scripture. And if it does not meet, trash it. So if a vision can be trashed, what about useless dreams? You dreamt and you saw yourself died. And you woke up crying. What's wrong with you? You need a clean slap to wake up your thinking faculty. What are you crying for? If you are really dead, how did you wake up? No, it's a question. If you were really dead, how did you wake up? Somebody said, maybe God is revealing to me a future. Revealing to a future of death? No, he's a God of the living. He has no business with death. And if you follow the truth, why will you die? Why will you die if you're following the truth? You die when you want to. You leave this world when you want to. So plan how long you want to stay. Is it not true? Who plans how long you will stay? Is you. There's no scripture that says God say you shall live here for 10 years. It's your choice that determines how long you live. You want to live long on earth? Pay attention to the word of God. Don't play with Bible study. Don't play with the teaching of God's word. Don't play with materials. Play the word in your car. Play it in your house. Play it in your office. Play it on your job. Let the word keep flowing. And you'll find a man that is always excited. Always happy. Even when there is no reason to be happy. Because his spirit man is in charge of his body. A man's spirit shall sustain his infirmity. But a broken spirit who can bear. What breaks the spirit is deficiency of God's word. When you are word deficient, any pressure will break your heart. But when you are full of the word, when pressure comes, you bounce it off. Netaleta. Look at the way you are looking at me. Mandelebo shakaya. The entrance of his word give it light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We walk by faith, not by sight. So when he said the works that I do shall you do and greater, what it means is I will be in you doing the greater works. He was attesting to the fact that the same Jesus you saw three and a half years on earth is the same Jesus living inside you now, carrying out his miracle power, his healing power, and his goodness to mankind. Hallelujah. Who committed sin? Who sinned? The father or the child? 
John chapter 8 verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those that accuse us? Had no man condemned thee? What's the key word here? Condemned. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. They inspect Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Go and sin no more. But this is the way to sin no more. Follow the light of the world. If you don't want to sin no more, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He told her not to sin. Then he pointed out to what will give her power over sin. Follow me. Follow the light. Come, let us walk in the light. For he that walketh in the light has no occasion of stumbling. The entrance of his word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light. John chapter 9 verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. Blind from where? Uh -uh. Blind from where? He was born like that. Blind from birth. Next verse. And his disciples asked him saying, Master, who did sin? That is how people think all the time. This man is born blind. His ancestral causes. This woman is born deaf. Is from the family bloodline. You know, honey, you go to the doctor sometimes in the hospital, they will ask you, this high blood pressure, is there anybody in your family that had it? What medical science wants to do is they want to connect you to ancestors so that you people will have an umbilical cord connection so that there is a blood reason why that thing is there. They want to give you a reason why you can never be healed. Medical science want to establish the fact that you and this problem are eternally together. That's why you must be aware of the opposition of science so falsely called. Because once they have connected you to your grandfather, even you in your head, you know that this one is my permanent luggage. <laughs> is there a madman in your family? Yes. Oh, that's why your owner started. You now sit down and remove trousers without knowing where. Your own has started. You will better change you in a hurry. Because you will be on the street. Medical science. Thank God for medical science. Medical science is like food. Jesus is the healer. You didn't hear what I just said. So now they establish who did sin. This man. Because for him to be born blind. Somebody's sin is responsible. He's harvesting from the family seed. And that this is, is out of this verse that many ministries are born in Africa. Did you hear what I said? Out of this verse, many ministries are born in Africa. If you remove this verse and its follow-up verses, they don't have ministry. Because every time you meet them, they must ask you, how is your family? Was your mother a native doctor? Has your father ever taken you to the shrine? When you were born, did they draw a mark on your chest? That is the open gate for evil spirits. They open your life to evil spirits. He said, no, my own is not in my chest. They open it here. He said, that's why you're a dummy. That's why you're failing exam. Because when they open it, they remove your brain and give it in the witchcraft world. I mean, look at, look at, look at, look at. Beware, lest any man spoil you through vain philosophy. He calls it idol fancies. Plain nonsense. Who did sin? And you know some of you, when something happened, you start looking for a reason why it happened. Say, so, um, what, why, why? Okay. Okay, I see. Uh, oh, I see. You are excusing why it should happen. It has no reason to happen. You are bought with a price. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It has no, somebody said it has no reason to happen. 
Jesus answered, oh, glory to God. I love Jesus. Neither had this man. He canceled generational causes. He canceled family history. He canceled bloodline reasons. He canceled every reason that any man has to offer. He said, neither had this man seen nor his parents. That is to say, what is wrong with this man is not seen. He wasn't saying the man was not a sinner. What you are saying is, sin is not responsible for this condition. Why do people get sick? Because of mortality. Don't look for reasons. Anytime you want a healing, don't look for reasons. Just receive healing. Anytime you want to heal a sick person, don't ask him to tell you the story. By the time he finishes telling you the story, your faith is on the ground. Tell him, I don't want story. All I ask is, what did the doctor say is wrong? Migraine, shut up, close your mouth. Migraine, out. Let them not tell you how the migraine traveled and how it arrived and how they contributed. It will knock your faith from prayer. Jesus answered, neither had this man seen nor his parents. He didn't explain anything to them. He said, but that the works of God should be made manifest. It's an opportunity for him to experience the goodness of God. It's an opportunity for him to experience the compassion of God. Look at verse 4 now. I must walk the works of him that sent me while it is day the night comet when no man can walk. God's power is regulated to an intent, salvation. It's not just power. No. No. It's power regulated. The reason why we have electricity in this building, comforting us, giving us light, making us feel nice, making our video recording to be beautiful for television, is because the power in the building is regulated. It's regulated. We didn't just carry power from high tension and connect. It will burn the building and all of us. Power not regulated is destructive. That's why the power of God is regulated within the, within the confines of salvation. If he's God, let him kill that man. You are stupid for thinking that God will kill a man because you said it. If God follows, you will have been the one to die sins because somebody has said that about you before. But the good news is that God is not a killer. And God is not a destroyer. My God is a good God. I'm talking about the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the Father of glory. There is no killing in God. There's only life in God. God is light. God is life. God is love. I thought somebody would shout a powerful amen. amen. So Jesus debunked that myth. He explained to us clearly that God's power carries God's character. So anyway, you see, that is God's power at work. God is good. So the power of God will be seen in goodness. God is life. So the power of God will be seen in giving life. See? God is light. So the power of God will be seen in giving light revelation knowledge. God is a miracle worker. So the power of God will be seen in the performing of miracle as a show of God's character. Peter summarized the ministry of Jesus in Acts 10 38. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good. The power was to do good. Always carried health. He always carried healing. Now as a believer, listen carefully. Always carry health and healing in your thoughts. Think health. Think healing. Don't think sickness. Think health. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Think health. Think healing. Never accommodate the thoughts of sickness and disaster. Carry healing thoughts in your mind. Guard your heart. Guard your thoughts. There are TV channels you must shut down. There are stories you read in newspaper you must destroy. There are things you should not entertain. 
Don't read that column on newspapers that carry gory stories of how people went through all kinds of situation health-wise till they died. It is not good for your health. Listen. Look at me, everybody. Look at me, everybody. Look at me. Those of you on television, look at me. If you must die, if you must die, and you here, make up your mind to die healthy. You decide that today. Some say there are many ways to die. By sickness, by torture, by accident. The important thing is I die. Thank God for you. As long as I remain your pastor, you make up your mind. Even if I will live, I will not live with pain. I will live with a smile. I will leave this world with a smile. I will not live with a pain and I will not be a pain to anybody. I will live with a smile. I will not endure the last days of my life. Say with me, I will not endure the last days of my life. Whenever that will be, I will leave this world by my choice, intentionally, with a smile. You didn't say amen to that. You've just settled something right now. I'm not going. Mm, 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 mm. Before you leave this world? No. 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 But it's choice. It's choice. You can choose to live with pain. It's choice. The choice is being made now. What you think on, what you feed your thoughts. What you feed your eyes, what you feed your ears, what you spend time focusing on is programming your tomorrow. Guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it are the forces, the influences, and the issues of life. Even when he's sleeping, the sickness is working. Sickness does not sleep. Uh, who am I talking to here? Sickness does not sleep. That's why sometimes when the man is sleeping, he starts, oh, 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 oh. they will call the doctor. Doctor, come, come, come. Doctor will wake him up. Because while he was sleeping, the sickness was working over time. Sickness does not sleep. So you too, when there is a symptom on your body, even when you are sleeping, keep the word of God going. Get my messages. Put them in the room. Amplify them with a speaker. Because you sleep in the body, your spirit is awake. And your spirit sustains your body. And listen carefully. Don't wait until sickness comes before you build defense. Build defense before sickness comes. Don't wait until sickness comes. You start running around. It is too late. You don't prepare for battle on the day of battle. You prepare ahead of time. So right now, make up your mind to be healthy all your life. Take the word of God and feed yourself. Am I saying something to somebody? Take the word of God. Feed yourself. Listen to the word. Play it all the time. Stay with the word. So you can be strong, healthy, and you can be, you know, effective. Make up your mind, I'm not going to be blind. Make up your mind, I'm not going to be deaf. Make up your mind, I'm not going to be a cripple. Make up your mind. I'm not going to be bad reading. I'm going to be strong. And I'm going to be healthy. And I'm going to be bouncing all the days of my life. Under the old covenant, Moses' eyes never went dim. Under the old covenant. Under the old covenant, Moses' eyes were sharp at all age he was reading. Make up your mind. And even if you're wearing glasses now, it's not too late. You can, you can make up your mind to drop those glasses. You take the word of God and speak them to your eyes and straighten your eyes out. So get the word 247. Remember, the woman with the issue of blood, four things happened. Number one, she heard about Jesus. She selected what to hear. She didn't hear the rumor. She heard about his good works. They were gossiping Jesus. 
They were bad mouthing Jesus. They called him Beelzebub. They called him the Lord of Demons. They called him a Gluton. They call him a wine barber. The one the woman chose to hear is his healing power. You choose what to hear. Number two, she received it. She received it. Number two, she received it. What was the sign that she received it? For she said. For she said. She didn't keep quiet. If you want to walk in divine health, you must know how to use your mouth. She said, I say, my bones are strong. I say, my muscles are intact. I say, my heart is healthy. You speak. You speak. I have 2020 vision. Betolea. Calling the things that be not as though they were. Even God who quickened the dead. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say I say. Everybody say very loud I say. I am healthy. I am strong. I am well. And I will keep being like that. I didn't hear a good amen. She said. Then number three, she did it. She said it and she did it. She didn't just keep talking. She did it. She stood up, pushed through the crowd, touched. She did it. In healing, there is always something for you to do. It's only in forgiveness of sin that you only receive. But in healing, you do something. He told the man, stand up, take your mat and go. Stand up, take all the healing miracles, they did something. He prayed for me, Peter's mother-in-law. After praying for her, he said, give her food to eat. There are some people who pray for you, order for food for them quickly. Give her food to eat. Jesus said, oh, yeah, yeah, give her food. Because if you don't give her food, hunger can bring it back. So give her food to eat. There is always something to do. Always something. In healing, there's always something to do. He touches the guy with clay. He says, go and wash. Go and wash. What about Naaman? Jump in the river. Seven. In healing, there is always something to do. There's always what? Something to do. She did it. She acted on what she said. Then Jesus called her and she narrated the whole story. Honey, you know, this was on the way to Jairus' house. And the woman interrupted and hijacked the anointing. She divided it. And held Jesus from going to Jairus. Jesus stood and settled her case. And allowed the woman to narrate her story. So Jairus can have faith. Jairus stood there and the woman preached healing to Jairus. When Jairus had heard the message of the woman, the people from the house came and said, the child has died. Jesus turned and said to Jairus, fear not. You must make up your mind not to fear. Say, I am not afraid. Say, no fear here. Say it very loud. Shout it, let every demon in hell hear you. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. When you allow fear molest you, it is messing around with the soundness of your mind. You have a sound mind. A mind that is not a coward. A mind that is not afraid. A mind that is healthy. So let it feed on healthy thoughts. Let it feed on healthy thoughts. Think on these things. Remember, wrong teaching produces wrong thinking. Wrong teaching produces wrong thinking. And wrong thinking produces wrong believing. How do you know you are believing wrong when you are speaking the wrong things? I don't know if I will make it. My mother died at 38. 
Watch what you say. That's how you know what you believe. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When a man goes around talking about, I don't know if I will last. I don't know how long I still have. I feel like I may die any day. When a man starts talking like that, that is the constitution of his heart and he shall have what he says. How do I know what you believe? What are you saying? This my sickness has come. Is it your sickness? I thought healing is your own. So what do I say? Sickness is looking for me, but I have my healing. Neither give room to the devil. Don't say it is my sickness. It is not yours until you say it is. Whatever Adam called them was their name. You can teach the word of God and you yourself may not receive it. So mind what you say. It's not enough to teach. You've got to receive what you teach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say with me very loud. I believe in the healing power. Stand up and say it very loud. Very loud, everybody. I want you to shout it. Let the whole world hear you very loud. Say, let every devil hear you clearly. Say, the healing power works for me all the time. Say it again. The healing power works for me all the time. Jesus is my savior. He is my righteousness. He is my healer. He is my preserver. My body is bought with a price. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. My body is Jesus' property. Sickness cannot stay here. Sickness cannot stay here. Sickness has no reason to stay here. They say, who's seen? It is not seen. Don't look for a reason. I, I didn't sleep well. Is that why you should be sick? Are you the only one that does not sleep well? There are other people that don't sleep well. Don't give a reason to why you feel the way you feel. Say, I hear you. So now I receive. Oh, Gabadaga. Say, I receive. Say, I receive. I receive. Right now. My healing in my body, every organ, every organ, internal, external, my flesh, my skin, my muscles, my tendons, my tissues, they are sound in the name of Jesus. Baragadagaya. Baragadagaya. Say every abnormality cannot function in my body. My body adapts to the healing power. Say that six times. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Now speak it to your body. Body, you adapt to the healing power. Say there is healing inside me. The healing power of God. Is resident on my inside. Therefore, body, you adapt right now. You align with the healing power. I am healed. I am well. I am strong. Say it again. I am healed. I am well. I am strong. I thought I would hear powerful. Amen. There's power in this building. And the power of God was present. To heal them all. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. No ulcer. No cancer. No high blood pressure. No sugar diabetes can survive this environment. None. None. I rebuke body weakness. Whatever has been responsible for excessive body weakness in your body. I command you today. Rooted and flushed out. Receive strength. In your mind, in your body. Say, I am strong. Say it again, I am strong. Say, my youth is renewed. Say, my youth is renewed. Speak it again. My youth is renewed. Like an eagle. I am strong. I am healthy. My hearing is guaranteed. All the days of my life. My sight is secured. All the days of my life. My bones remain strong. All the days of my life. And my physical structure remains intact all the days of my life. I didn't hear powerful amen. 
Now turn to your neighbor and say, sickness has no excuse. Point your finger to your neighbor and see if I'm the one doing it. Sickness has no excuse to live inside your body. You are not an accommodation for sickness and disease. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your spirit, in your body, in your soul, which are God. I thought I'd hear powerful amen. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I know you've been blessed, affected, impacted by the word of God. And I believe, God, that the revelation of Jesus will grow big on your inside until nothing else matters. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I said in the beginning of the broadcast, if you live in the area around anywhere in the continents of this world where you follow my teachings, but there's no Christ-centered teaching church in your community, and you either want to start one, or you want to identify with our own campus, we call our branches, campuses all over the world. Today, all you need to do is to send me a mail and we will connect you with brethren in your area who follow my teachings. So together you can grow with them, evangelize, raise disciples, and build the kingdom of God. If that's what you want to do, or you want to start a campus in your community, you don't know of any, you want to start one. Yeah, we're committed to training you, equipping you, and enriching you so that you're able to effectively start a campus, pioneer a work in your community, and bring other believers together to be fed and nourished in the knowledge of Christ. If that's what you want, also send me a mail today. The email address is Damina at yahoo.com. Hey guys, we love you. You know, God doesn't want you to be isolated. So if you don't belong to a place of worship, maybe because of what is taught there, or you're not growing in that church, and you want to really grow, then I invite you today to adventure with us and identify with us. Give us the opportunity to serve you, to feed you, to equip you so that the purpose of God for your life will find fruition in the name of Jesus. We love you guys. Always a joy to share with you the grace of God. I'm looking forward to connecting with you in the next broadcast. And until then, enjoy the grace of God and be blessed. Amen.